So I want to thank all the organizers, including uh, Edith, uh, and, uh, well, I don't see the, the others, uh, you know, Caroline and uh, Art, somewhere over, over here. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for this, and uh, I, I hope uh, that will be uh, an exciting time for us to exchange. Uh, I'm particularly grateful because starting off allows me then to relax. I'll be done uh, in a bit, so that's great. So um, without any further ado, uh, what I'd like to, to do is to take you over uh, some aspect of uh, the work in my, my lab, but of others as well, in uh, trying to understand how uh, you can organize chromatin in the nucleus and shape it. And so uh, my uh, sort of uh, red thread will be the bricks and the architects, and you will see soon what I mean by that. And you have this uh, drawing, which uh, I have to comment because you saw it uh, just before uh, with a dog presentation. So this is a, a drawing from an artist, uh, Paul Liam Harrison, who was a resident artist in the context of the epigenesis uh, network of excellence, uh, revisiting uh, this view of how a cell can choose its destiny in a landscape of uh, possible uh, uh, paths and uh, we have all been sort of uh, stimulated and inspired by uh, these views. So uh, another view uh, is the sewing kit, uh, which uh, is also how you can think about uh, getting things organized. Uh, and uh, I quite like the idea of having different types of tools and different types of colors. Uh, this is sort of also getting to the ideas of the different domains in uh, chromatin with the distribution of marks that we can think of. So uh, what uh, we have uh, really uh, considered is how uh, building chromatin uh, domains take into account the dynamics going from uh, the very basic unit, the nucleosome, up to higher order organization in the nucleus, and how this is really intimately uh, linked with DNA-based processes, uh, such as transcription, uh, repair, recombination, replication, and so all these events can potentially impinge on the organization, but the organization itself can also impinge on this phenomenon. So if we take the very basic unit, the nucleosome, how is it formed, and, and also how it does vary, because that is also a key uh, aspect of uh, the diversity that can be brought in this organization, with the choice of uh, modification at the DNA level, but also the choice of the histone variant composing the particle, and the range of uh, modification that can be imposed either on the tail or on other parts uh, of the histones. Then uh, the way they are organized in arrays, um, binding factors to uh, this component and transcription factors that contribute to punctuate the organization. RNA uh, are also part of this. And then uh, finally, the uh, uh, geography in the nucleus where the different uh, uh, regions are located. So uh, basically, we can translate this by revisiting this picture with the choice of a cell fate during development by thinking about how you define landscape uh, now at the level of uh, chromatin using these different um, elements. And uh, so the idea is that this is more than packaging because there's indeed two meters of DNA that have to be packed in the nucleus, but it's not, not just that. It's also how that does uh, relate to the function uh, at the DNA level. So uh, there are different scales that we need to consider for how to assemble, maintain, or change this organization. And in 4D, because these different scales to consider are space and time during the cell cycle development and in different environments. And uh, the, the point is also to make the distinction between uh, changes that can relate to signaling that will be in a short-term range, changes that can revert quickly, uh, to uh, changes that will be more of an epigenetic nature that can be inherited through multiple cell division and possibly in some cases through meiosis. So here I, I'd like to focus a bit on um, histone variant and histone chaperone. And uh, so, sorry. It's not moving? Yes. And so uh, the way uh, to look at this is how we can establish the nucleosome landscape at a chromosomal level. Um, so the circuit linked to genome function, cell fate, and its environment uh, uh, 
and that enable this assembly, maintenance, and change of chromatin in 4D involve a series of components that I've listed here. Uh, DNA modifying enzyme, histone variant, histone chaperone, histone modifying enzyme, chromatin remodelers, chromatin interacting complex for higher order organization RNA, I mentioned it, to contribute to this different scale. And all these parameters are working with DNA. So this is certainly an important message. So now when we think about cell identity and stability, there's really a challenge to maintain or change uh, the marks and uh, the organization. So replication is clearly uh, a timing when uh, there will be a, a window of opportunity for uh, a change or uh, an important time to duplicate the parental identity. And so you can think of that as uh, potentially program changes in identity or unscheduled changes. In one case, that could be related to differentiation. In other cases, it could be neutral or pathological associated with problems that you could see in uh, disease. And here, the sort of uh, duplication uh, of the, the identity of the parental cell will be essential to maintain a proper lineage propagation. So this is for replication. For repair, that uh, can happen any time during the cell cycle. And in that case, the same type of issue have to be considered because, again, you can consider maintaining the status that you had before, preserving the chromatin stability and integrity, or have unscheduled changes that could uh, represent a way to memorize damage and that can also impinge on the future of these particular cells. And some may be neutral or pathological, depending also on the environment. So uh, getting back to uh, the bricks and the architects, uh, here are the uh, bricks that I want to talk about, the histone variant as building block. In terms of histone, they come into uh, this uh, flavor with uh, four distinct uh, components, uh, H3H4, H2A, and H2B. And uh, mainly uh, variant exists for H3, H2A, and H2B. H4 accepted in testes uh, doesn't have uh, many variants in mammals. And then uh, what I'd like to stress for the, uh, the architects or brick layers, the histone chaperone are really important in that they escort histones throughout all their cellular life, from their synthesis to their place of uh, deposition, as well as uh, for their eviction and potentially uh, disposal. So uh, in terms of the variant, I'd like to discuss with you the case of the histone H3 variant in mammals as this major brick. So they come into uh, sort of uh, three different uh, uh, flavors. So you have the replicative variant exemplified here with H3.1 and H3.2, which expression peaks in S phase. You have the H3.3 variant called replacement variant that is expressed throughout all phases of the cell cycle, accumulating in quiescent cells and in long-lived cells. It has been highly connected with transcription and also with the major rearrangement that are observed uh, on sperm uh, after uh, fertilization. Then you have the most, uh, and H3.3 differ uh, from four or five amino acids from uh, the replicative variant. And then you have the most extreme uh, variant, sometimes called deviant, uh, sen H3 or sen P in mammals, that is specific uh, of Central America region, really marking the place where you build up uh, the kinetochore. So you can see here the differences in terms of uh, amino acid, but there are more players, and um, I invite you to look at um, these different uh, reviews for more. So uh, how the architects choose their bricks? I, I quite like this uh, um, um, drawing that uh, is uh, on a wall close to the Curie Institute that uh, for me uh, reminds me of the possibility of having a perfect, perfect match between the chaperone and the variant, but uh, the world is never perfect, so I don't think that things are exactly like that, but there are certainly cases where you have a careful or careful uh, sort of match. In other cases, it's more casual. In some cases, I mean, it's a sort of a matter of laziness, taking what comes by. So uh, what do I mean by that? So there are indeed, if you consider the different uh, uh, variant dedicated chaperone that are listed there, so the first one is CAF1, which stands for chromatin assembly factor one, initially identified 
by Bruce Stillman, which has uh, this unique property of linking uh, histone deposition to DNA synthesis. So this is particularly important during S phase and in replication. You have then the hurry complex. Here I've only presented uh, one of the subunits of the complex and the DAX ATRX uh, uh, complex, but they can also come separately. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is a, a complex that is uh, very familiar to Doug, obviously, and that has been associated with um, uh, um, disease uh, of uh, quite uh, significant importance that we can discuss. Then there's, uh, for the Senpei variant, this uh, particular chaperone called HJOC, which is really uh, very faithful, uh, and it's called holiday junction recognizing protein that may have uh, something to do with the way it was initially identified uh, in terms of binding to uh, holiday junction uh, DNA. And then there are these uh, chaperones, which are more casual, that can uh, interact uh, potentially with a different uh, variant, uh, ASF1, and I'll get back to that, anti-silencing function one, and uh, NASP, but that is only to name a few, there's more. So uh, the message is perhaps that some care more about who, like these guys, more uh, about what for, perhaps uh, like this one, and there are others that are in between. So having said that, uh, I'd like to stress the aspect of the new deposition for new histones. So this is what we understand, and at least that's the scheme, for uh, what happens during DNA synthesis. There's a, a CAF1 mediated deposition of the newly synthesized histones where CAF1 exploits the interaction with PCNA to uh, enable the deposition of the replicative variant as a dimer with uh, H4. So that happened at the replication fork, but also at sites where there's a patch of synthesis as the one that can be uh, observed when you have nucleotide excision repair or other event associated with repair where there's also patch of synthesis. Then you have a pathway uh, also for new deposition independent of DNA synthesis. And in that case, I'd like to stress the role of hurry which does so um, sort of um, everywhere, I, I'll get to it in a minute, and DAX and ATRX that have been also put forward to uh, provide uh, the capacity to enrich H3.3 um, uh, variant in particular region. And then there's uh, this other pathway, also independent of DNA synthesis for the deposition of uh, SENPE, and this is mediated by HGERP. So what I would like to stress here is that there's a connection with the cell cycle. This obviously is operating in S phase mainly, although that can happen elsewhere. This can happen any time during the cell cycle, including S phase in post-replication or pre-replication. And this is actually uh, operating in late mitosis G1. So I think it's important uh, to think about the dynamics of uh, the histones in these different time windows. So to sort of uh, summarize for this um, histone deposition in cycling cells, during replication, you will have a CAF1 mediated DNA synthesis couple deposition, mainly for the new deposition of H3.1. And then uh, if you have potentially regions that have not been properly uh, assembled, you can bring in via hurry uh, H3.3. And also, there's um, uh, an interaction between hurry and POL2 that can provide means to bring H3.3 in regions that are highly transcribed. And so uh, here, uh, the connection with the uh, potential recycling could be done through ASF1. That's uh, the model at present. But ASF1 can also function as a handover to bring in new histones as an acceptor and donor. So this scheme shows during replication dynamics mixing uh, old and new histones. And so far, I've only given for your attention a bit on uh, what happens for the new histones. And um, I think that it is important as well to consider what we know in more steady states in the way uh, um, territories uh, have been described on the chromosomal level, where there's this nucleosomal landscape where you have uh, uh, Senpe at the centromere mainly. You have uh, H3.3 in pericentric region. You have uh, also uh, H3.3 at regulatory elements and uh, gene promoters. 
uh, also at telomeres and H3.12 uh, distributed in euchromatin uh, in uh, various places. So how does this come about and how do you maintain? And so how this can be used in some cases to respond to environmental cues uh, in short term and how is it propagated in the longer term? So one thing I'd like to stress that uh, there are variations uh, on this theme uh, in terms of the component, the variant and the chaperone in terms of uh, mutation and dosage in the context of cancer. I uh, have to stress the case of the H3 mutation, like the K27M mutation that was reported and drew a lot of attention on the H3 variant in the context of uh, very aggressive glioblastoma. But then there's also mutation in DAX and ATRX that have been associated with some of these uh, uh, glioblastomas as well. Upregulation, so change in dosage for ASF1 uh, in the context of breast cancer, also uh, in the ALP pathway, and overexpression of SENPE in uh, very aggressive cancer and HGRP associated with chromosome instability. So this is illustrating the fact that in the context of cancer, all this can be uh, sort of reshuffled and uh, uh, um, unbalanced. So uh, this importance of dosage, um, I would like to illustrate this with a couple of examples for SENPE and HGRP in tumorigenesis. So one uh, aspect that uh, we had observed, uh, along with other people uh, actually, uh, like um, Don Cleveland and uh, others, is that SENPE overexpression can lead to an ectopic redistribution in chromosomal arm. And so that is uh, certainly something to uh, consider and to which extent it does interfere with the functioning of this uh, chromosomal region is uh, a, key, uh, a key point. Then there's this other situation where we saw that when there's overexpression of SENPE and its chaperone HGR, there's a form of addiction when you're in the context of P53 null tumors because when you start uh, um, money, well, um, diminishing the, the dosage of HGR, then the uh, tumoral cell die specifically in this context. And then there's another case which I think is really important to stress is the, the case of CAF1, where here by altering the dosage of CAF1, you can change the somatic cell identity. And that was uh, actually uh, uh, shown to uh, facilitate the capacity to promote, prom produce IPS more efficiently simply by uh, tuning it down. So having said that, I just want to get back to this question of cell identity and the challenges during the cell cycle. The question is how you inherit or lose a mark. So depositing a mark, the question will be the nature of the mark, histone variant uh, post-translational modification, the deposition, so the factors that come uh, about, the PTM writers, and the genomic location, which we have seen. Then the challenge, uh, so what will be the challenge during the cell cycle, transcription, DNA damage, cellular signaling, metabolic conditions, and stress. And uh, here, uh, I, I'd like to make a focus uh, on the challenge of DNA replication, because this is a time where you can dilute or duplicate, deposit or remove. And so the question will be the deposition of new histones, which I've already put uh, forward uh, a few uh, uh, stones uh, or bricks in the wall. And then there's the question of uh, DNA and histone distribution, one versus the other, the parental histone handling, and potentially DNA polymerase collision. So if we get back to the variant that I have listed for the three different variants, we have the different chaperone to consider, and we have the location that I have mentioned before. So now let, let's focus on, on that. So the challenge at the nucleosomal level, you have disruption of one parental nucleosome for two to be formed if you want to maintain the nucleosomal density. And uh, that uh, um, comes about with a transfer, well, disruption and transfer of the parental one and uh, um, the addition of newly synthesized histones that come along with their uh, uh, sort of um, particular uh, marking themselves that will then have to adapt to where they are. So this is the de novo assembly, which we have discussed mostly. So the question is how you coordinate recycling uh, and de novo deposition with the four progression. And so that is an important aspect for the maintenance of nucleosomal density, 
but also for the maintenance of histone-based information in that context. So that has been something uh, we had uh, really uh, entertained a lot of uh, discussion and work with Anya, and I'm sure that uh, later on she will tell you um, more about some of these aspects. Concerning uh, the aspect uh, during uh, DNA damage, I just want to stress that in that instance, the mixing of old and new material in collaboration with Sophie Polo showed that in this context, there's a conservative redistribution of parental histones around the DNA damage. And this is coordinated with the repair progression through a particular factor called DDB2. So there's thus a recovery of parental histone in repairing chromatin along with the mixing of some of uh, new histones. So, so this is really a balance that is delicate and in which we have to understand uh, how it can be controlled or, or altered. So today, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss with you one particular story with a focus on A3.1 and A3.3 during replication with three major questions that are open for us. So uh, what is the genome-wide distribution of this variant re um, with respect to replication timing? Then what is the 3D distribution and dynamics in single cells during S phase? And then what is the fate of the parental histone variant in S phase at replication sites? So to try to uh, get some information at that level, we have uh, um, tried to look genome-wide at the distribution of H3.1 and H3.3 with respect to replication timing and transcription activity. So you have here the chip seq corresponding to H3.1 and H3.3 in terms of their enrichment here illustrated for chromosome 3. This is aligned with the reference uh, sequence uh, for the corresponding genes in that region and with the uh, uh, replisec uh, data where we can see the relative enrichment uh, for early versus late using uh, this uh, um, ordering of early towards late uh, region in the, in the genome to partition the organization. And so what you can certainly see, and that has been really work uh, by Jean-Pierre, Audrey, and uh, Alberto, what you can see is that basically when you look at uh, the image here, H3.1 and H3.3 mirror each other in their distribution in the genome. What is also interesting is that H3.3 form more discrete peaks and uh, they are uh, aligned uh, with early replicating region, whereas H3.1 has much broader uh, distribution and more uh, uh, um, um, associated with late replicating region. So uh, then uh, when looking at that with respect to transcription activity, here we, we've partitioned the, the genome uh, based on transcription activity using RNA -seq, nascent RNA-seq data. And you can see that there's nice correlation between transcription uh, for H3.3 and it's a bit uh, the reverse for H3.1. Yet uh, it's not only that because at any time you can also see uh, differences. So uh, I'd like to stress that there's this enrichment of H3.3 in early replicating and transcriptionally active uh, chromatin and H3.1 enrichment in late replicating chromatin. So having seen that, we have at hand here a 2D cartography of the H3.1 and H3.3 landscape with H3.3 enriched in early replicating and transcriptionally active chromatin, H3.1 in late replicating chromatin. So now, how does this translate into spatial distribution and nuclear geography in single cells? What are their dynamics, in particular during S phase? So how can we follow all the new histone variants at replicating chromatin foci during S phase? So for that, uh, we uh, wanted to do this 3D distribution by following both the histones using uh, a way to label the histones with a SNAP uh, tagging, I'll get to that, and labeling nascent DNA using EDU. And doing this, uh, we can uh, analyze at a single cell level, local territory, by having this simultaneous labeling of the histones and the DNA. So when uh, we use that, we can track uh, parental histone dynamics uh, with the SNAP tag system. So here, the idea is uh, that was pioneered initially by Dominique in the lab, 
you do uh, you have this snap that can be labeled with a, a fluorescent dye that is uh, permeable in the cells and so you can label all the old histones with a pulse and then you can visualize in that case old histones while you chase and here you have the new histones that will not be labeled so conversely, which is the one aspect that we have been using a lot, you can uh, instead quench first and then chase and only uh, label the new histones. So there's means to follow uh, the global uh, old or new histones with this uh, method. So here I just want to stress that the analysis um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, a super resolution has enabled to get very interesting information with respect to replication sites. And so that's the work from Cristina Cardozo, where she could see the, the sites of active replication clusters in the nucleus and even identified by going down to the highest resolution uh, uh, at the level of individual replicants. So, so there's a, a, a potential here to go very high in terms of resolution. So Camille has tried to use uh, two color storm microscopy uh, to follow here uh, the histones and the replication sites. And so just uh, to illustrate what uh, the storm uh, is, I just want to use a Parisian view, uh, which shows you uh, every hour uh, at night, the Eiffel Tower is blinking. And uh, for each blink, it's one molecule. And so uh, if you, uh, can localize this individual molecule and uh, record all this information, and then you can have a super resolution image that can be reconstructed from all this information. So the idea is uh, really to exploit this uh, for the analysis I will show you. And so here you have uh, one of these um, image uh, that uh, shows the two types of colors. So what uh, Camille has done is she has used an approach with uh, clustering and spatial relationship analysis between uh, the signal uh, using a density-based spatial clustering uh, algorithm to define what we call conglomerates, so a uh, uh, region where there's a tight association of the component we are analyzing. So for each of them, we can measure the volume and the density. Then we can evaluate and compare the distribution of this parameter for each population of uh, conglomerate. And we can do that at different stages during the cell cycle using EDU as an S phase marker. So we can start by a global detection in the whole nucleus. And so uh, we can do that for H3.1 or H3.3, and we can have these properties. So we have distribution plot where we can compare between distribution, condition A and condition B, see where you have the mean, uh, where uh, the majority of the population is located, and if there are changes or if the shape uh, is changing as well. So here uh, is the type of image that we could collect for H3.3. So you can see that there's labeling for H3.3 in all phases. With EDU, you can see here the labeling uh, of the replicating cells. And uh, you can see here with the, the measure of the volume and here the density uh, that the volume basically in the different cases outside early or mid late uh, S phase is the same. Whereas for the density, you can clearly see that the peaks are shifted. So uh, we can depict this as follow for H3.3. So the volume uh, of this region remain the same in all the cases. However, you have high density in early S. It's diluted in mid late and it's sort of average in uh, outside S phase. But there's this constant uh, volume. If you do the same analysis now for H3.1, what you see is uh, that uh, there's a shift in the volume that is uh, pinpointed here. And you can also see a shift in density. So, uh, the, but the, just going the other way around. So here you have in early S phase, a volume that is comparable to the volume that we have with H3.3, but then it does shrink and you have a higher density and you have this uh, small domain outside S phase. So this is just looking at them in a global manner, but now we can look at that by clustering the histone and the replicated DNA and compare them throughout S phase. So when we do that, uh, we can define early, mid, late domain and see uh, what uh, we can detect. 
And you can see that basically that reiterates what I said before, that the volume is remaining the same, but then there is a dilution uh, in mid-late uh, when you're really assigning to the site of uh, replication. And for H3.1, you can see large volume to begin with and smaller and higher density. So now this is what we have uh, for the whole nucleus during S phase. So the scheme I, I showed you and the domain that are replicated, where H3.3 organizes as a unit of stable volume independently of chromosome territory, while H3.1 unit volume is variable. H3.3 is diluted throughout S phase, but then progressively enriched at early replicating region, and H3.1 mirror this behavior. So next, uh, the question is, uh, what happened to the parental histones? And so now uh, we can use uh, what I mentioned before, this labeling uh, by a pulse at the beginning, and then follow uh, the histones through uh, several cell division. And so this is what uh, you can see, and you can see for H3.1, the dilution of the staining when you do that through the division. And you can see that after 48 hours, you're reaching a similar type of level, which we thought was good for a, a comparison of the uh, state of, for the uh, parental histones. So we choose that time point. And uh, then uh, in this context, we could then analyze the histone detection within the EDU foci. And so uh, what I'd like to stress is uh, to try and have an idea of uh, how we can sort of play with the system. We wanted to see if uh, we could uh, look at parental histones upon uncoupling of the fork. So you can do that by treating the cells with hydroxyurea. In that case, you increase single-strand DNA after the fork because you cannot incorporate uh, uh, um, uh, DNA precursors here. And in that case, uh, there's, of course, an uncoupling uh, of uh, the recycling of the histones. So this is seen here, and that's uh, something that Anya had seen with uh, Armel, where you have uh, a labeling uh, here, you see RPA, uh, which is much stronger upon the HU treatment while you diminish uh, the, the, the other signal. So when you do that, um, you start to see that uh, there's uh, definitely uh, something happening. So you uh, get a shift. And this shift indicates that uh, there's uh, less uh, parental uh, histones that can be recovered. So there's a loss, a, pro a problem with recycling that is clearly visible and that can be monitored on na the nascent DNA. So that can be used sort of as, as a reference. Now we are getting back to the fork, so I'm sorry for this very busy slide, but I already mentioned to you what happened with new H3.1 and new H3.3 uh, at the fork, but the question of the old histones had remained uh, uh, an issue. We had put forward a role for ASF1 that could contribute to that, uh, along with uh, interaction with MCM2 and work uh, from Anya as well uh, uh, as Dinsho Patel had shown very nice structure for uh, the way the MCM2 could interact with H3H4 tetramer. So uh, the idea is, is ASF1 uh, actually uh, involved in this phenomenon and can we show that or see an effect in the, the system that I just depicted before? So uh, we then uh, did uh, uh, SI against ASF1 and tried to look at whether in that case, where we know that we uh, decrease uh, the single-strand DNA, we slow down the fork, but we don't activate replicative checkpoint in that time frame. So here, the ASF1 knockdown, when we look simply at that level, like we did before, we do see that there's definitely a problem in recycling parental histones, so it's less. So uh, both for H3.1 and H3.3. So then the question is uh, how can we look at that in more detail? So in, you can see here when we do this by normalizing to EDU, you have in both cases this shift that can be detected and uh, we have uh, here a loss of parental histones at the site of uh, replication. So uh, there's no single-strand DNA in that case, no checkpoint activation, still histone parental loss. But where do they go? 
So to try to look at that, we've tried to uh, do clustering and spatial relationship for the parental histones. So counting the histone detection at increasing distance from the sites of EDU. So if you have an EDU site, you can look at uh, how far you can detect parental histones. So that allows to uh, evaluate the local recycling and parental redistribution relative to replicative DNA. So doing that, uh, here you can see it for H3.1. What you see is that this is at the site that are replicated, but you see here that in, this is early S, there's this tail that indicates there's a, a significant fraction that does not get back. So uh, at least what is there is uh, sort of shifted. And uh, you see also this tail uh, at uh, mid-late S phase. So this is schematically represented here where this ASF1 knockdown lead to a redistribution of parental H3.1 away from the replication foci. So what about H3.3? So here, remarkably, in early S, uh, although there's less recycling, they remain at the same place. Uh, however, in mid-late S, uh, here you have this tail as we've seen before. So here, what we do see is that there's this redistribution in mid-late, but somehow uh, there's a way to uh, recycle or bring back at the site some of the H3.3, uh, parental H3.3 for redeposition. So uh, to sort of conclude here, what I would like to say about retention and local recycling of parental H3.1 and H3.3 is that they do require ASF1. The HU treatment uh, impairs local recycling of histones. So I think this is important to bear in mind as well because a, a number of uh, components that can affect and create replication stress would uh, have to be considered in that instance. This knockdown of ASF1 uh, does impair this local recycling with a spa spatial redistribution that affects both H3.1 and H3.3 in late S phase, phase but only H3.1 in early S. So uh, the question is how this can lead to an H3.3, H3.1 unbalance. And so that may reveal, uh, at least with the fact that H3.3 can be uh, uh, recycled uh, at sites of replication, some kind of a safeguard mechanism in early S phase region where you have most of the transcription active. So, um, well, these are the general conclusion about this little story. There's a system to dissect H3.1 and H3.3 distribution in 4D, which uh, I think can be exploited further. Here, uh, we are providing uh, some hint in terms of the timing of replication related to H3.3 enrichment genome-wide, even more so than transcription. I didn't get in the detail of this analysis. And we also identify a particular spatial organization entity for H3.3 that is independent of chromosome territory. So how does that uh, function is really uh, an interesting aspect to explore in terms of chromatin properties. And then there's this uh, importance of ASF1 that ensure this local recycling of parental histones. And uh, of course, uh, whether uh, parental histone mishandling and H3.3, H3.1 and balance can function as a book and marking and have long-term consequences. So uh, I'd like to end up by uh, acknowledgement to, for the people who did the work in the lab. Um, mostly Camille Clément for the STORM uh, and uh, Alberto Gatto uh, for the uh, bioinformatic uh, analysis, uh, Audrey Forres for uh, the CHIPSEC, uh, and Guillermo uh, also for, for this work, uh, along with uh, some work on the, the STORM, as well as Jean-Pierre and Dominique, who started with uh, some of the SnapTag experiment, and also key collaborators uh, in Angela Tadei's lab, Junit Mineatab, for uh, some of the work with the STORM, and Maxime Daon and Bassam Hajj on this aspect, along with Antoine, and of course, our platform for microscopy and uh, next generation sequences, and also our funding. And the very last thing, I also want to stress that uh, there can be a life after epigenesis. Uh, and uh, if uh, you want to be a supporter, you can sign on the web. It's still there. So the more you sign, the better. 
And so at the moment, uh, it's for the end you. And uh, that has to link up with other groups uh, for a stronger potential for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Terrific talk. And uh, yeah, Duncan. Yeah, just shout. With the, with the system with the snap tag, when you knock down the SS1, yes. do you see the old pistols going back into new locations? Do you do a pull down of the snap tag? Like well, this, um, this, is, this is, of course, a, a very interesting point. We are, we are actually working on that uh, <coughs> to try and see whether uh, this uh, relocation can be in particular region. Uh, that uh, requires, um, technically, some aspects which are challenging. But it's, um, it's on the way. So I hope uh, we'll be able to provide you with an answer to that in the near future. Yes, by chip. Yeah. So how strict is this um, link between early replication and H3.3? Because you often find H3.3, it's say retroviral elements and telomeres and so on that yes. I always think of as late replicating. So I just wonder how hard and fast that, that rule is. Well, I think this, this is also <coughs> sorry, uh, 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 an important point. So, so when you are doing these uh, analyses, it's in general terms. So mm. when we are looking at regions that are transcribed, that's uh, what we see. And the trend is uh, uh, in that direction. But there are a few places which uh, are the odds. So that's also why I was also saying that uh, it's not the case for all the places, so it's right. a general trend, yeah. and these places are actually uh, those that may be uh, most interesting, I think, to explore, mm. and we, we are looking at that, so, so they are there yeah. in the data. You are right. Good. Yes, Edith. I'll shout. Yeah. Yes. So I was just wondering um, if you've ever looked at cells that just exit quiescence to find out if um, the first you know, S phase has different dynamics to subsequent S phases. Because in a way, I mean, the rules they could be, yes. are very different to the rules in typing uh, cells. And so I was just wondering how um, how that gets set up. Because I know that you've already looked at quiescent cells and you're looking at cycling cells. So yes. So uh, th this is a very important point that you're making, uh, Edith, because it's uh, really uh, leading to try to look at different states uh, that could be during development, but also in this particular instance. So we had to set up the tools to be able to do that, uh, which uh, we now sort of uh, have. And so uh, um, I think it's one, one step at a time. I hope uh, we can uh, get to that point because um, for the moment we just have, at least for the storm, the data with sort of standard cells uh, in which we have defined how to do it. Now we know that we can get some information, so it will be really interesting to explore that in the context of the system that we have now designed to get the snap tag working as well. But I, I don't, don't know yet, but it is clearly a place where one expects to see something interesting and we'd like to know. Yeah. There's one over there, yes, please. Well, thank, you, thank you for this, this wonderful insight in this complex biological mechanism. Uh, from a, a more clinical and epidemiological perspective, how vulnerable is this? Is this related to disease or do you envision this being related to a different medication use? Is it yes. in cancer? So, uh, well, for, for the sake of this talk, I decided uh, to <coughs> sensitize people to, to some basic mechanism, <coughs> but uh, I, I definitely want to uh, stress um, a, a few points in terms of how that can be uh, considered in light of uh, uh, disease. So if uh, we take uh, the uh, example of a uh, version that have mutation in terms of uh, H3.3, <coughs> the question then is how do the version that have the mutation are handled? Do they follow the same types of dynamics or not? Do they get at the same places? Do you change some aspect of the um, properties of, uh, of these cells? And so these are things we, we don't know for the moment, but I think it would be very important uh, to try and understand and then perhaps get to a uh, way to intervene uh, onto that. I think that would be perhaps uh, a bit closer to intervene with is, uh, for example, uh, I mentioned at the beginning the overexpression 
of each job and send pay in a particular subset of uh, cancer that are uh, P53 no. And so in that case, if you downregulate uh, HDR, uh, or if you find a way to interfere with its function, you really kill specifically the tumoral cells. So we've shown that in a mouse model using uh, allograft, where we could bring in uh, um, the, the, the tumoral system there. Uh, so there's here something that could be looked into further. And so I, I could go on with uh, other uh, cases where uh, the change, the balance between the histones could be uh, awry. Uh, the replication stress that I mentioned is something that has been put forward as uh, a problem uh, uh, in, in initiating uh, cancer uh, uh, tumorigenesis. And so uh, what happens in that context that has to do with unbalancing the redistribution of the histones and how that does contribute to uh, the um, development of uh, these particular cells is, uh, is important. But all that will have ultimately to be considered within the tumor environment, with the heterogeneity, which are the cells that could do things that others don't and uh, then be selected, what uh, type of advant advantage some cells could acquire. So these are things we need to understand. Yes, yes. Art, please. This program, the 4DN program, there's an identical name uh, program in the States. Uh, you may be having some identity crisis uh, soon. So is there some kind of overlap or how do you plan Yeah, so, so uh, you, you're absolutely right. In, uh, and so this is why uh, it is called 4DNU, which is a different uh, name. But I think that uh, the idea is also that even uh, if uh, there's no way uh, it should be a Me Too type of program, it has to cover uh, other aspects and be synergistic. So the uh, program in the US <coughs> is uh, focused on uh, human. And so I think the 4D and U has uh, the breadth of uh, trying to get into model organism as well, broaden that uh, perspective to uh, well, get access to uh, other uh, information, uh, to be more onto the dynamics, uh, exploring also question of uh, changes in time. Um, that is um, another aspect. And uh, there's also uh, the, the need to bring into it uh, the potential for uh, understanding uh, issues related to um, disease development, uh, and uh, also engage uh, with the population uh, in more general terms. Uh, so, so I think it will be uh, necessarily different, but it has to be, uh, if we want to put that in the context of a Fed flagship, a uh, big challenge in terms of the new technologies, bringing together what can be done both with a uh, uh, sequencing approach and imaging approach to fill the gap between the two types of things, to understand uh, at a higher level the way uh, the organization in the nucleus can be integrated in the cells, in the tissue, and in the organism.